Christ is born. Alleluia. Jesus is among us. Alleluia. Shout with joy. Give thanks and sing. Alleluia. Christ is born. Today's gospel lesson is taken from John chapter 1, verses 1 through 14. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and without him not one thing came into being. What has come into being in him was life, and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light. The true light, which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world came into being through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to what was his own, and his own people did not accept him. But to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God, who were born not of blood or of the will of the flesh or the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and lived among us, and we have seen his glory, the glory as of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. This is the gospel of the Lord. He was asked to visit a Christmas story. He was asked to visit a Christmas story. For centuries, he was asked to visit Old Billy. At least it seemed like centuries, with Irma Reisig haranguing the Reverend Cutler to go see Old Billy ever since the bishop appointed the pastor for Broad Street Memorial Church. Irma was a displaced Pennsylvania German. When her husband accepted an engineering position at the Philadelphia Navy Yard during its post-war heyday, the couple moved to the suburbs west of the city. Irma was also a venerable children's Sunday school teacher and lifelong choir member who grew up with the Apostle Paul and owned a face with less warmth than the statuary lining the church's terracotta facade. She capably played the gospel standards on the piano and 
whipped up kitty Christmas pageants quicker than the innkeeper could turn away the Holy Family. For the church's children, he was the de facto parish matriarch. For others, Irma was the parish menace. She did not relate well to adult congregants from behind her half-moon reading glasses. She intimidated them as young Sunday school students and maintained that threatening stance decades later. You see, Irma's overbearing, rigid demeanor and incessant finger-wagging reminded congregants of their own stuffy, spinster great-aunt, ordering them to sit properly while blowing out birthday cake candles. It wasn't a warm, fuzzy memory. And Irma wasn't a warm, fuzzy personality. At church meetings, Irma, right or wrong, could be counted on for a dissenting opinion. Always the contrarian, she complained about the sexton sleeping in the boiler room. She didn't approve of the preschoolers making crafts that spilled glitter onto the rugs. You'll never get those little sparkly things out of that tight axe, Mr. Weave, Irma carped in her thick accent so foreign to the metro Philly suburbs. Irma also made it her business to keep the pastor on his toes. She couldn't do a thing about other souls in the parish passively aggressing against her, but being on the pastor parish relations committee, Irma held sway over the preacher. Don't forget to visit old Mrs. Dutter. Her arthritis is flaring up something awful and she can't get to church. True, Mrs. Dutcher couldn't get to church, but she could get to the beauty shop religiously every Friday morning. Pastor Cutler saw her there as he looked in the picture window, passing by on his way to weekly chaplaincy duties at the county hospital. A prominent mainline dame, as a previous pastor inelegantly referred to her, Mrs. Dutcher couldn't bear 60 minutes on the sanctuary's padded pews, but had no problem sitting for three hours to get that pink Radnor rinse applied to mask her gray coif. Talk about a bad hair day. And old Miss Dietrich isn't doing well either, Irma added. What's wrong with her? After Cutler queried in exasperation. Well, I'm not exactly sure, but I think it has something to do with the choir director's choice of an anthem on Palm Sunday. Irma, it's Advent, the cleric retorted. Well, I don't understand it. That's why you best pair up after a call. Smooth things over, the parson cynically mused to himself, rolling his eye. Now, Irma didn't actually say the words about smoothing over things, but that's what she intended. She was of the conviction that the ordained hired hand was supposed to do her bidding. You see, when Irma reminded the pastor to visit someone, three things could be guaranteed. One, the person would have the honorific adjective old prefixed to their name, as in old Mrs. Dutcher, old Miss Dietrich, and old Billy. Chances were Irma Rysick was the elder of them all. Two, the visit would entail giving ear to a litany of complaints about the former preacher and family, or some nostalgic aspect of the church that is no longer, or a worship guest who provoked grave upset by sitting in their pew. The third thing the pastor could count on was that Irma herself had done something to irk the person and would dispatch the now triangulated minister as a vicarious apology to smooth over things. Now, there was one parishioner whom Irma wanted Pastor Cutler to visit ever since assuming his responsibilities at the church, Old Billy. Irma's track record of suggesting visitations being what it was contributed to the minister's reticence about calling on the elderly gent. Plus, Billy was never described as someone experiencing an acute crisis of biblical proportions like others on Irma's list. Old Billy's name was regularly appended to the name of another person she deemed in immediate need of pastoral salve. Billy was never a priority for Irma and subsequently didn't rise to being one in the pastor's opinion. So, after four and a half years serving the congregation and Irma's nagging about the man, it seemed like Pastor Cutler had been asked for centuries to visit old Billy. Late on the afternoon of December 24th, having finalized the decorations for the evening's Christmas pageant, Irma exited the sanctuary, then observed a blade of light leading from the pastor's study. Pastor, he called, heading down the hallway. Pastor, have you visited old Billy yet? 
lifting his weary eyes from the Yuletide sermon before him, Irma rudely poked her head inside the study, asserting, I think he really needs a wizard. It's Christmas Eve. Billy's all alone ever since his elderly mother entered the home. You would think someone from this church would care enough to check on him, he sniffed with an accusing air, intentions for the pastor to do her bidding being unmistakable. I'd give anything for the days when pastors I'll stop by as soon as I finish this last paragraph for tonight's sermon, the Reverend Cutler interjected as an olive branch before Irma could conclude the indictment. Well, you need not do it immediately, he huffed, proudly sensing her success at riling the normally unflappable cleric, then added the remonstrant coda, it's just that a wizard before the actual holiday would be nice. Old Billy, the church directory divulged, lived all the way across town in the Mount Airy section of the city. At 5.15, the evening commute would be harrowing as office workers dashed home for the holiday. City Line Avenue was always hung up when traffic slowed to beep at Dave Roberts, the Channel 6 meteorologist reporting outside the donut-shaped studio. The Kelly Drive cattle chute was under construction, along with sections of the Shore Kill Detestway. The pastor didn't relish the timing of this winter solstice excursion. But Reverend Cutler motored through it all, arriving at the littered street where Billy resided. Street lights broken, the car's headlamps exposed tightly packed homes. Rows of semi-detached houses with unkempt myrtle terraces and stone balustrades lining the sidewalk revealed a block that exuded its middle-class status a half century earlier. More recently, the neighborhood fell victim to five drug-related shootings, a symptom of chronic urban disrepair and one-party political complacency. Pastor Cutler parked the conservative four-door minister mobile, tugged at his overcoat's belt, and sidled out of the bulbous black sedan. Making his way up the spalled concrete steps, the pastor pulled from his rabbit vest pocket a pack of matches stuffed there to light the acolyte's candle bell later that evening. Striking one of the sulfur-tipped strips of cardboard to confirm he was at the correct address, sure enough, 7119 Kreshheim Road, William Higginbotham was jaggedly stenciled onto the oxidized gray mailbox. Taking advantage of the illuminating flame, the pastor noticed the doorbell button was painted over and stuck out of order. He rapped on the tinny aluminum storm door. Not 15 seconds later, the interior foyer door swung open. Five feet away, a tall, straight silhouette stood in the darkened doorway and called out, Merry Christmas, followed by a nervous laugh. The porch light glared on, an older man with intense eyes and thick head of wavy salt and pepper hair extended his hand in greeting. A visit from a man of the cloth on the holiest night of the year, he proclaimed, nervously laughing again. Should I feel like the shepherds visited by the heavenly host or the Christ child with one of the wise men before him? No doubt it was a provocative initial inquiry from this stranger who seemed even stranger now than before the greetings odd query. Never one to think quickly on his feet with a disarming rejoinder, the minister opted to ignore this line of conversation, proffered his own Merry Christmas, and introduced himself. It's a genuine pleasure to meet you too, Reverend. I'm William Higginbotham. Of course, you know that already, he pronounced with perfect diction and the simultaneous wink of an eye. Drawing a breath through his long elliptical nostrils, the previous interrogation continued. Tell me, Pastor, how long have you been at Broad Street Church? Oh, um, uh, four and a half years, he said, respondingly, tugging at his white cleric's collar while clearing his throat in an anxious attempt to hide the guilty tardiness of his overdue visitation. Well, do come in and have a seat. I was just about to prepare dinner. Bathed in the jaundiced glow of the parlor's pre-depression lighting, old Billy appeared to be in his early 60s. A two-day growth of white whiskers gave the wintry appearance of a fresh coat of snow. 
His printed shirt with wide collar and paisley tie of mod 1970s styling were each soiled with dried food stains. A sweater draped over his square shoulders was barely more than strips of faded woolen cloth that did little to warm him. Even the wide whaled cordovan corduroy trousers revealed signs of wear at the knees like a little boy's. It was a tattered, disheveled ensemble finished with tan leather clod hoppers marked by the scuffs of too many years and several thrifty resoles. The pastor also curiously noticed the blonde pieces of straw in Billy's hair. Quizzical gaze, the old timer spied. Billy quipped, do I still have straw in my hair? Yes, quite a bit. Oh, goodness. You see, when I threw that last pine log on the fire, the embers popped, sending a shower of sparks from the hearth. Surprised, I, I reeled back and tripped on the edge of the rug and reached out to that mahogany end table to, to break my fall, he meticulously detailed, pointing to the scene of the mishap. Then the table tipped, toppling the crash bisque figurine of the Virgin Mary, which didn't break, thank goodness, and delivered a load of manger straw onto me as I lay on the floor. I thought that I got out most of it, but evidently not, he embarrassingly confessed, picking through his hair. It's no problem, the Reverend Cutler reassured him, noting again the well-spoken diction. I'm just glad to finally make your acquaintance. And I yours, he said with that uncharacteristic loudness. Would you like something to drink or eat or join me for supper even? Well, a cup of tea will do fine. The family customarily eats Christmas dinner between worship services, so I'll take a rain check on your supper invitation, but thank you just the same. I'm not having a big fancy meal, Reverend, just soup and crackers. I mean, if you're not eating for another three or four hours, the soup will help tide you over. I always eat alone, so dining with you would be an honor, he nodded in polite recognition of the ordained guest before him. There was that uneasy laugh again. Come out to the kitchen, he gestured. I just opened the can before you came. The minister rose and followed old Billy into the kitchen, the two wending their way through stacks of yellow newspapers and dog-eared magazines, as well as an exceptionally huge mound of mail. Why, perhaps it's the dead letter office where the North Pole letters to Santa eternally reside, the good reverend chuckled to himself, immersed in thoughts of the season. The kitchen was a photo from the Board of Health's case study file collections of dirty dishes everywhere, liquid contents from the trash can spilling onto its sides like the wax of a cheap holiday candle, the oven coated with the carbonized soot of a long ago fire, a foul odor eminently emanating from beneath the sink completed the slovenly scene. The Reverend Cutler took his seat on a cracked and crimson vinyl clad dinette chair. Billy, Billy pulled an open can from the vintage cold spot refrigerator, dumping its contents into one of the unwashed handled pots on the stove. Lug splat. He turned the gas burner on low, then stepped alongside a calico curtain covered cupboard where he reached for soda crackers. Two bone toned soup bowls with hairline cracks and chips along the rim were set at their respective places. The minister's place having been cleared of envelopes and balled up used paper napkins. Two beverage stained glasses filled at the tap were set down. Old Billy's hand, like a pelican's beak diving into the sink full of water, retrieved a spoon. He then shuffled back to the stove, stirred the pot, and tasted it. Warm enough, he exclaimed with an air of self satisfaction. Removing the spoon from his lips and holding it in the air like an orator driving home the conclusion, he repeated with emphasis, warm enough. How anything kept in the refrigerator could be moderately warm at such a low flame for so brief a time was anyone's guess. In all likelihood, the pastor deduced, if he were not present, old Billy would have suffered the distinct misery of eating cold, uncooked soup. With company in attendance, though, he put on the unrehearsed act of, eat, of eating the meal. 
here was someone who could have made excellent use of a sack of coal from Santa. Each bowl was filled about one third with an institutional green lumpy mire. Childhood fairy tale specters of porridge and Ebenezer Scrooge's gruel invaded the preacher's fertile mind. Then, as if the thought of the food he was about to consume wasn't unsettling enough, the spoon pulled from the dirty dishwater, the one used to stir and then test the soup's temperature, was hastily rinsed and thrust into the pastor's hand. Go ahead, eat up, Billy encouraged. You don't want to let the soup get cold. There's nothing worse than cold split pea soup, believe you me. Uh, let's pray first, proffered the Reverend Cutler, earnestly folding his hands in front of the humble provisions. His mealtime petition for blessing of the food was intoned with sincerest conviction. The two men ate in silence. Old Billy downed everything in short order, a well-practiced regimen to manage the culinary unpleasantness as quickly as possible. The minister consumed his meal in decent and orderly progression, a spoonful of lukewarm soup, a bit of stale cracker, all washed down with the cloudy content formerly flowing from the Philly faucet. Finishing his repast, the rumpled host chimed, I can't offer you any dessert. A party conversation can be just as filling. The men retired to the parlor with old Billy talking about his family, particularly his mother, who recently took residence in a nursing home. He conveyed how diligently he cared for her, a nurse, in her declining years. It was the least he could do for someone who devoted her entire life caring for others at the Methodist Hospital downtown, he commented with pride, pointing to her nursing school class picture hanging on the wall. He was especially grateful for the time she had been a nurse to him after a prolonged period of depression, an ordeal replete, replete with electroshock treatments at the Commonwealth Psychiatric Hospital. His troubled emotional return from the Korean police action was most unexpected. It all happened during that semester on the GI Bill, after I matriculated at the Wharton School. Harold Stassen was the university president. You know, he became the governor of Minnesota and ran for president several times, Billy digressed. Regarding the original man of the house, Billy never knew his real father. His stepfather worked as a railroad auditor on the Pensy, traveling weeks at a time. Desperately wanting a father's attentions, Billy adored the man, but was consistently rebuffed, passed over for his half-brother, Jim. Young Jim became the giddy recipient of poster-sized color pictures of steam-belching locomotives that are in great demand among collectors nowadays, Billy footnoted. Whenever father was out of town for more than a week, Jim would have an assortment of railroading memorabilia delivered to him. Billy, though, never received so much as a send my love to your older brother in the letters accompanying Jim's presence. Decades later, a painful memory lingered on this holiest, or what had often become for Billy, loneliest night of the year. Brother Jim, the pastor learned, became a successful millionaire with his own engineering firm out west. Always the dutiful son, he followed in his father's footsteps to this day also disregarding Billy. I have a cousin in the Lehigh Valley who plays in the Allentown Band, he proudly recalled, and some cousins in Reading. I write to them, but they have families of their own too, he explained, excusing why they ignored him, just like he did for his sibling and stepfather. The pair chatted for some time until Billy informed the pastor that he needed to ready himself for Christmas Eve services at the church he now attends a few blocks away. Oh, I'm still a member at Broad Street and always will be, loyalty and all. It's just that when the congregation moved from downtown to the main line, well, my heart and fond childhood memories are there, he waxed. But I can walk to this nearby Baptist church. I have friends there from the neighborhood and don't drive. You know how it is. The men parted company by bidding one another a Merry Christmas. Poking his head out the door after his visitor exited the porch, Billy yelled a thanks for coming, followed by the trademark nervous laugh. The minister waved in acknowledgement and chortled too. 
Hmm, he thought to himself. No complaints about another church member. No try to top this list of medical woes. Just a poor, lonely old parishioner grateful for a visit on Christmas Eve. To think that I was so reluctant to stop by. It was a penitent reflection. Not everyone appreciates pastoral visits, he concluded, but old Billy certainly did. It was not until the Reverend Cutler read the Christmas story at the midnight worship service that he fully realized the import of his time with Billy. For in the famous narrative recorded by St. Luke, there is a son with bands of cloth draped around him, noisome smells penetrating the mean accommodations, and pieces of straw mingled with his wispy hair. He had a mother who stuck by him in rough times, and a stepfather of sorts, siblings who often thought ill of him, and unexpected company one special night. For centuries, he too was asked to visit, and he did at Christmas. Let us pray. Lord, God of heaven and earth, we rejoice on this Christmas day, this holy day of prayer and celebration and song and laughter and good cheer. We thank you and praise you as we recall the great wonders you have sent us, that brilliant new star and the choirs of angels and the cry of a newborn baby in a feeding trough cradle. We praise you for the word made flesh in this little child. We behold his glory and like the hosts of angels on that first night, we praise you saying glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace to those who have his good will. Renew in our hearts today the wonder and awe of the first Christmas miracles. Remind us of the moments of heavenly hope and peace and joy and love that we have experienced in our lives and open our hearts and minds to trust there are no limits to miracles that you have in store for us, for with you, nothing is impossible. When hopelessness threatens, tear down the strongholds that hold us captive and open our eyes to new possibilities. Show us again the peaceful beauty of that holy night so many centuries ago. Soothe the pain of fear and apprehension that robs us of a calm, quiet spirit. Grant us peace that passes understanding, peace in our relationships, in our churches, and in the world, especially when it seems the world around us is spinning out of control. Release the joy in us that has been suppressed by the harshness of the world, by fear, uncertainty, and struggles of everyday life where our ultimate joy is in you. Thank you for this sacrificial gift of love, your son, our Lord and savior, Christ Jesus. We rejoice in his saving act on our behalf. Receive our promises today, where we choose by faith to make this good news of great joy a reality in our own lives, that we may enter into your love story for humanity, to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with you, our God. Amen.
Now may the true light shine on you. May the sun sent by God be your guide and strength. May you go in peace and live in hope in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.